So, so set this up for us a little bit. We're uh, we're talking about this uh, correspondence starting at the end of August 1947 between uh, Martin Heidegger and Herbert Marcuse. Indeed. So Herbert Marcuse was a student of Heidegger's. I believe that he was a student of Heidegger's, I want to say in the late twenties, I, I think it comes up some point in these letters when they're talking about uh, the, how Marcuse had studied with Heidegger prior to Heidegger's involvement with national socialism. But Marcuse and many of the people with whom he was associated as part of the Frankfurt School, Adorno, Horkheimer had emigrated pretty early on in the 30s uh, to, to the United States, mostly to California. Now, also the Vienna Circle had emigrated to California, different tradition, more analytic philosophy, but also a number of left uh, socialist friendly uh, philosophers from Germany slash Austria. And so Marcuse was also Jewish, but that's not necessarily uh, the reason that he, he uh, is so uh, upset with Heidegger in these letters, as we'll see. He tries to make a, a pretty clear argument for why he thinks that even those philosophers who were not Jewish, but from Germany, had, could see where national socialism was going from the very beginning. And so this, these letters take place after the uh, Heidegger has published Being in Time, after Heidegger has a more or less, uh, a, a, he's not as much of a public figure as my understanding at this moment. Um, and he hasn't been in correspondence with many of the people whom he taught in this era. He is not in correspondence with the Frankfurt School and he's living, I think at this point, somewhere in between that Black Forest hut and, uh, and Freiburg. These letters are addressed from his, his address in Freiburg, but he's not a rector anymore. He was rector at some point at University of Freiburg. And so, he, yeah, this is a private correspondence with them that was published after the fact. I should also mention that there's one book that, uh, that Marcuse wrote about Heidegger that makes mention of some of the feelings that I think Marcuse articulates here. And it might be of interest to some of your, your listeners uh, because it's called Heideggerian Marxism. And it, we, we all know that Heidegger was not fond of Marx. He was not fond of Marxism. And Marcuse, of course, was. And Marcuse was fond of much of Heidegger's at least early philosophy. There's Heidegger's philosophy is generally divided into two eras, uh, pre-Kera and post-Kera. The Kera is known as the turning. Uh, Heidegger not only thinks that there's a turning in his own thought, but he thinks that there's a, there's a turning in Dasein, the term that he uses uh, for being there, being thereness. Uh, it's sort of something that occupies the central place in his thought. He thinks that there is a, a shift not only in his own thinking, but in Dasein itself. And so this divides the way that, that Heidegger thinks about intentionality, which is the big thing that, and, and the Seinsfrage, the question of what is being, that drives both his early and his late philosophy. So anyway, that's some of the... Yeah, the okay. Drills. So, so I, I should also say on the, on the political side of all that, you know, when you say that Heidegger, you know, isn't, isn't a fan of, of, of Marxism, uh, you know, which like... You know, to, to be really clear here, um, you know, Heidegger, you know, much of this correspondence is, is going to be about um, how much and how long. Uh, but uh, but Heidegger was at one point, you know, a Nazi. Uh, he uh, like like he like literally a member of the Nazi party. Uh, and um, and this it's not like, OK, so you, you mentioned the Vienna Circle and sort of early, you know, analytic philosophy uh, and. You know, I, I think it's possible, it's obviously possible to just have reactionary or political views and, you know, you have, and for that to have absolutely nothing to do with your uh, philosophical interests. Like, I think that it's entirely possible that if Frege had lived long enough, he would have been a Nazi. Uh, he, he seems to have been, you know, 
pretty nationalistic and anti-Semitic and, you know, have, have a lot of attitudes that would have lent themselves to that. Uh, but also that doesn't really have anything to do with his thoughts about, you know, set theory or, or, or anything like that. Uh, those, those seem to be, you know, robustly uh, separate subjects, you know, uh, but in Heidegger's case, without, you know, without saying like, oh, if you agree with Heidegger about this or that, you know, therefore you're, you know, like logically committed to Nazism or something. But, you know, I think we can make a weaker and accurate claim that it's not like a, it's not unrelated. Like, like, like this, there is this sort of deep uh, anti-cosmopolitanism that is, that is, that is a big part of, of his, uh, of his philosophical work. Uh, and, you know, sort of uh, hearkening back to, you know, what he would see as the sort of, you know, I don't know, basic wisdom of, you know, German peasants and, uh, and, and, and even a sort of weird, um, uh, extremely intellectual sort of anti-intellectualism, you know, going through, you know, going, going through parts, uh, parts of it. So it's, it's not, um, and then of course, as you say, Marcuse, uh, is, you know, is a, a Marxist, uh, even if, even if not necessarily an Orthodox one as, as time, uh, as time goes on. I mean, this is the, this is the stuff, you know, Marcuse, Adorno, all these people are, are, are the people who, um, like right wingers in 2021 have have gotten themselves worked up about because they have this sort of narrative by which uh, the uh, um, the Frankfurt School, uh, you know, like by influencing later academic uh, currents, you know, is is therefore responsible for any any cultural trends that they don't like. And therefore, those cultural trends are are implicated in you know revolutionary Marxism. You know that's how that narrative goes. Yeah, it's a big question in Heidegger's scholarship to what degree his thoughts about Dasein it are analogous to his uh, political givings and especially his involvement with the with National Socialism. So I actually was never a huge Heidegger fan or interested much in Heidegger prior to this last year. I took a class with Graham Priest, whom I know we're both fans of, and mm -hmm. I took a class on him on Wittgenstein and Heidegger. And there's a lot of scholarship on both Wittgenstein and Heidegger because there's a lot of commonalities in their philosophy that at first may not be very apparent. But it, they, it's also a commonality that works in uh, opposite, uh, op opposite directions. So. Wittgenstein starts with the Tractatus, with a referentialist realism, where he has uh, a certain mysticism and quietism about what we can say and uh, what we can't say. And the Tractatus it works through those things that we can say and tells us very clearly that there are certain things, aesthetics, ethics, that we cannot talk about. And there is a sort of mysticism that one can detect in that uh, that that portion of what we can't say. Now, in the philosophical investigations, of course, Wittgenstein uh, decries a lot of what he had earlier thought. Now, there's a lot of Wittgenstein scholarship today that says there's more commonalities between these two texts than we initially thought. But regardless, there is no longer that same mysticism. It's more so about language games and the sort of things that we can say are part and parcel of the ways that language operationally works and how those language games function. Heidegger's earlier work, uh, being in time the pre kara work, while it does have maybe some notes of mysticism, those mystic parts are more so existentialist. And with being in time, there's two parts. There's the first part, which is quite pragmatist. Uh, Hubert Dreyfus, famously uh, an analytic philosopher who taught uh, being in time at uh, Berkeley and influenced a generation of analytic philosophers who teach Heidegger, uh, like uh, John Hogland and uh, Blattner, Taylor Carman, a lot of analytic philosophers who teach being in time were taught the first part of being in time and taught to skip over the second part because the second part is the existentialist stuff. And that 
doesn't really have too much mysticism, but after the post kara writings, especially in what is metaphysics and a lot of what uh, a lot of the papers that make up uh, the basic writings, which I think is composed of 10 or 12 uh, uh, individual essays of Heidegger, there is a growing mysticism. And what we can talk about and what we can't talk about is again, a theme that pops up. So this is how I got interested in Heidegger vis-a-vis -vis Wittgenstein. And since then I've been sort of working through some of the mutual problems and the way that Heidegger's interpreted. This has been a free public preview of a patron exclusive episode of Give Them an Argument. To get the rest of this episode and every other patron exclusive episode, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess.